the way. One of the things that people generally in the world of water, uh, I would say, is they they go very deep in their expertise, and um, and that uh, maybe it's, I have a lack of patience. I don't know what, but but I I've chosen to go very wide, very broad in my world of water. So I've written uh, two books. Uh, written I have them here just so I can show everybody. Uh, I just pull them out. I have uh, the first book was Let There Be Water, uh, which. By the way, Oded Distel is on this call, and if you have your copy handy, you can go to pages 151 and forward, where I talked at the chapter with Oded Distel looks like he works in the entertainment industry. Uh, so uh, so uh, Oded, it's just always a joy to see you. I, my wife and I just adore you, and uh, great to have you back in our lives. And this is about water scarcity. This is about what we can do about a world that's ever drier. And, uh, and then the second book is about drinking water. It's called Troubled Water, What's Wrong with What We Drink? And this book is deeply about the fact that we've been sold a bill of goods by you know, the EPA and by the government, by our mayors and our governors, whether the Democratic or Republican makes no difference whatsoever. They are about cost containment. They are not about health, health promotion. And, um, and they allow us to drink water that is definitely subpar, all the worse in many other countries of the world where levels of regulation and governance are even lower. Uh, and this is this is a silent health crisis or a gigantic health opportunity to pay you want to look at it for us to improve water. And then just in passing, my third book is a book of inspiration of quotations that have moved me and helped me to be what I am. There's a long section here about water quotations, as you wouldn't be surprised. So if anybody wants any of these, just contact. Israel, as you and I have discussed, is one of the few nations on this planet that is a thirsty, starved nation or was, and figured it out and, and got the solutions for them to be able to not only have water, but to have a surplus of water. So let's, let's dive in by talking about some of the ways that Israel did this. And let's start with, as you and I talked about, how did they educate the consumer and the, the, the person on the street about water and its preciousness and its value? Yeah, so so it's a it's a really it's a holistic story here because <clears throat> the education, which leads to the creation of culture, which leads to political change. You know, there's a big dispute as to whether politics is downstream of culture or whether culture is downstream of politics. I believe that politics is downstream of culture, and um, but in that discussion, what Israel did was they created a water revering culture, and from that. Um, it became rel relatively easy for the government to ask for sacrifice from people. It became relatively easy for the government to ask people to think about water in a different way. It became relatively easy to price water, not wildly higher. It's not like bottles of, of Evian or uh, Pellegrino, but but you know slightly higher than what we're accustomed to, but but getting incredibly better results with that slightly better pricing. And 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 then it it, it gets people to change their personal behavior how they shower, how they use water, how they think about water. And because of the fact that Israel is a kind of a country of inventors and a startup nation, it, it, it becomes, I, I may have the wrong number, but several hundred of, of and this thing that Uded Distel uh, managed for the government of Israel, several hundred different Israeli water startups that tried to approach it from many different angles. Uh, I'm also currently deeply involved in thinking about agriculture within Israeli company, uh, which is transforming flood irrigation to drip irrigation, which will save oceanic amounts of water every year. But that culture, that education leads to culture, that culture leads to political change, that political change leads to a dynamic economy, that a dynamic economy then has an outward ripple effect that the whole world now, maybe every country, but perhaps Iran, but every country around the world benefits now from Israeli innovation, Israeli is, Israel is an inspiration. And whether you're a rich country that will learn from Israel's desalination or a poor country that will take up uh, other technologies of Israel that's uh, easier and cheaper to adopt, um, Israel has served very much as a role model. I, I hasten to add, I'm not an Israeli, I'm an American. But when I learned about what Israel was doing, I thought it was a, a story that just had to be told. So let's talk about the pricing issue, because... Many places in the world are subsidizing water and that the cost of water, the delivery of water to people throughout all of the world, whether it's the developed or undeveloped world, is underpriced 
what did Israel and what do you think um, the world needs to do to price water to its either true cost or its value? Well, what needs to be done is almost politically impossible to do. And But Israel did it. And again, I'll go back to the first question you asked me and the answer I gave, which is that culture became the determinant of politics. And so because of the fact that people accepted the fact that they live in a very dry region with extremely scarce amounts of water, and ideologically, Israel wanted to have Jews from all over the world immigrate to Israel. They in actively encouraged more people to come in rather than what most countries do, like our country, America, but they want fewer people to come in. You know, um, So as a result of that ideological sense, they knew that they had to make themselves water smart and water available. In terms of pricing, what they did was they took politics completely out of water. They turned it over to a technocratic, apolitical authority called the Israel Water Authority. And, and they are charged with the responsibility of figuring out how to get the most water at the highest quality for the largest number of people at the fairest price possible. And they, they, they have no, really basically no political, uh, uh, there's vaguely one political person at the place, but he, has, he or she has a five-year term and can't be replaced unless, you know, embezzlement or something like that. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of freedom of, of movement. And below that one person, everybody else is, a, is an economist or an engineer or a technocrat of one kind or another. And, and when they come along and say water needs to be priced at X, nobody wants to pay more. I mean, Israel is they may be water revering, but they're not robots. They're human beings. Nobody wants to pay more. Um, but on the other hand, they, they very comfortably accept that because they also simultaneously understand what they're getting for. And if I could just close with one other thing on this answer, is that in America, and I think, this, as I said, there are about 50 people on this call, um, there are exactly 50 people on this call, that, that um, in America, we have to work very hard to find stories about water in the media. And most of those stories are crisis stories. You know, the water main broke, the water's contaminated, children are sick, you know, something like that. In Israel, Water is a common topic of conversation. It is virtually every publication has a water correspondent. It is common to hear water stories on the nightly news. And therefore, it helps the media is an integrated part, not by demand. It's a democratic society. The media does what it wants to do. It's a free market economy. But by virtue of the fact that the public is so concerned about water and so interested in it, they get this. And so one of the things that I'm asked sometimes what we can do. I, one of the things I argue is we can encourage our local media to tell us more about what's going on in water and our communities, our nation, and around the world. Well, as you said about the, the culture is so critical and to have people truly talk about water and value water, and as you said, not just about the problems, but about the solutions that are there. You spoke about um, agriculture. Yeah. Most people don't realize that 70% of all of the water used globally goes to agriculture, food, production of food, the feedstock for livestock. And so looking at agriculture- And, is, and, and also fiber, cotton also. Cotton. And so looking at solutions from the, the food industry and the growing of food is so important. And you talked about a company, Endrip, that you've become deeply involved with. Uh, Endrip. Endrip is the- repository of a revolutionary patented technology out of Israel that did something that has been the, the dream for 5,000 years. <clears throat> About 5,000 years ago in the Delta, uh, Nile Delta um, uh, region and also in the Tigris and Euphrates river basins, they began irrigating crops because there wasn't enough rain. They began irrigating crops by flooding the fields. They created canals that came out of these giant rivers and they would flood the fields. And then for the next 5,000 years, that has become the dominant form of irrigation. Now we think of that maybe as only in backward countries, but even in the United States, 40% of all of our irrigation here is flood irrigation. And, and, and flooding the field has many, many negative consequences and no positive ones. It uses way too much water. It suppresses the yield of the, of the crop. It creates a need for much, much more carbon and carbon production and you require more fertilizer. 
And so this idea of how we can get rid of flood irrigation, well, 65 years ago in Israel, pressurized drip irrigation was invented. But the problem with that is it's a good solution. It's a great technology. But the problem with pressurized drip is it's extremely expensive to install. And therefore, it is almost nowhere being used for commodity type crops, corn, wheat, potatoes, rice, alfalfa, sorghum, cotton, sugarcane, and so forth. That's 50 different crops. And it's used only for sugar, for um, it's used only for like for wine grapes, for avocados, for a handful of other things like that, or where there's very deep government subsidies. So pressurized drip is a wonderful technology, but one that ultimately is a failure because it's only about 3% of global agriculture that makes use of it. And this is 65 years after it's been invented. So why is that the case? Because farmers cannot afford to put the infrastructure in the field. You need a lot of electricity to purify the water. So it's, it's tap water quality cleanliness. And you need a lot, a lot of electricity or diesel to propel the water across the field. So what NDRIP has done is using only the gravitational slope of a flood irrigated field, of which there are 650 million acres around the world, about 85% of all irrigated fields in the world are flood irrigated. Again, 40% of the United States, 90% of the state of Arizona is flood irrigated. By taking only the, the gravitational slope of the flood irrigated field or any laser leveled field, you can transform it into a drip irrigation experience, saving up to 70% of the water, increasing yields by up to 45%, cutting carbon use by at least 50% and with rice over 85% and save the farmer a gigantic amount of money on fertilizer because you need half as much fertilizer to use. It is a complete virtuous circle. And therefore, when I learned about this, I became very excited about it. I became a, I became, I became a significant investor in the company. And now it is in 15 countries, some thousands and thousands of acres. It will be the dominant way in which the Bureau of Reclamation will save the Southwest over the next three to five years. The Colorado River and Lake Mead will be saved by this Israeli invention. That's an example of an innovation for yes. water that is going to be one of the key solutions for us globally to solve these challenges. I wanna to go to, as you suggested, Seth, Heather asked a question relating to desal. And we know that Israel is the leader on the planet for desal solutions. And while America and California has a handful of desal plants, it, there's still a huge amount of reticence and um, just, just uh, not acceptance of this. So let, can you talk about desal and how we can make desal work? What is, what's going to make us be able to say, this is the future that we're going to have for our water treatment and purification? One of the, change, one of the differences between Israel and say the United States is that the Israelis pride themselves on the let's get going mentality and we'll fix it along the way or we'll do it better the next time we do it versus we're not gonna start anything till it's absolutely perfect. And that's, the, that's a philosophical difference. It's also a cultural difference. And therefore, when Israel decided to go into uh, desalination, it only took them a handful of years to build their first desalination plant. And then they now have five, there's a sixth one under uh, that's being planned and there'll be seven or maybe even eight over the next 15 to 20 years. That's all, there's another thing about Israeli water, it's very long range planned uh, out. And, and, but by contrast, the largest desalination plant in the Western hemisphere, which is not quite as large as Israel's largest uh, desalination plant, uh, uh, it, it, the largest in Western hemisphere is in Carlsbad, California. And just to give a thought about this, the Carlsbad, California plant was 14 years, Heather, from the time they said, let's build this thing to the day they cut the ribbon and opened the facility. It cost a billion dollars to build. A lot of it cost litigation delays. Uh, it costs about $60 million a year now to operate. And it produces, if I can do acre feet, acre, an acre foot is about 325, 326,000 gallons. It, it, and it produces about 52 million acre feet a year. So it's a lot of water. It's a lot, a lot of water. But here's what you need to know. What you need to know is that when you think about solving uh, the crisis in the, in the Southwest the United States, 52,000, uh, 52, sorry, 52, 52 million acre feet of water is a nice start, but it doesn't get you even close to what you need to do. And so desalination is a very good solution 
for municipal water. It's a backup. It's an insurance policy. It could be 100% of your municipal water, but there's no credible way at the cost of producing it that it can be completely used to, to, to replace, say, the Colorado River. So when we, need to when we need to think about solutions to our water crisis, we need to have lower cost, high volume opportunities. And that's, by the way, that's why I got involved with NTRIP, but I'm not gonna keep talking about NTRIP. But DSAL, uh, uh, Governor Ducey of Arizona has been talking about, we'll build some DSAL plants and that's how we'll solve the Arizona water problem. There's not a chance in the world you can do that. Not when you have, not when you have 800,000 acres eating about, eating about 10, uh, 10 acre feet between, I'm sorry, between four and 10 acre feet per acre of water a year. Just the math doesn't compute out. It can't be done. They can't build enough desalination plants and it can't produce enough water for you. Well, we're talking about a solution there, but we're also talking about the challenges and the problems. And ultimately they come down to economics, right? It's, it's what is the cost of that plant? And then everyone talks about the energy, but Israel has figured that out because the cost is not coming into the um, the equation where we can't afford it. We have to afford it. And the rest of the world is going to catch up, I believe, with Israel that they're going to afford it because it's the greatest source of, of water on our planet. 70% of all the, the planet is the oceans and 97% of our water is salt water and ocean water. I know, Seth, we can go deeper and deeper and deeper. So, 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 so I just want to say a, a word that I bring out in force in, in my book, Troubled Water, and I want to just raise it, which is that we can totally afford to raise the price. So the problem we have is that water pricing in America is not set by independent body. It is set by mayors and city councils. And because people have been educated to think of water prices and sewage fees as kind of a tax increase, they refuse to... Uh, mayors and city councils refuse to raise the prices casually. And what they prefer to do is to let the water, the pipes in the ground rot. They prefer to allow positions that are essential in the water utilities to go unfilled. They prefer to have old, old, old technology. They prefer to have less safe, less healthy water. And this is mayors and governors, again, whether Republican or Democrat. And this is, this yeah. is the system. That's the first problem. The second problem I highlight in, in, in Troubled Water is the size of our system. And we are a large country. We are 50, 40, say, 40, sorry, sorry, Stuart, no offense to you, but we're 48 states contiguous. And you could argue that in the 48 <laughs> states, put Hawaii and Alaska on their own, but you could argue in the 48 states, what would be a logical, rational number of water utilities that would be good for managing? Now we have some large states like Florida, Texas, California. We have some small states like Vermont and Rhode Island and Delaware and so forth. So, so you could ask what is a rational number, maybe 30 water utilities, maybe 60, maybe 80, maybe 100, 150, maybe 200, right? 300, but how many do we have? We have 51,535 51, drinking water utilities in the United States. We have 16,500 sewage treatment facilities in the United States, utilities. And so therefore we have about, call it about 70, thousand separate entities and i'm going to write a novel someday my my all my other books are nonfiction, but i'm going to write a novel someday about an iranian cyber attack that's going to set up a national panic on water because all they need is to get three or four little cities and screw up their water which they can do because it's all ancient technology and easy to there's no cyber defenses in most of these places and there's no federal regulation that demands what they have to do to do it properly. And we are really screwed. We are really at risk. What we need to do is to get politics out of the pricing of water. And we need to get our utilities consolidated down to a rational number of at most a couple of hundred. And we're, we're sharing this prompt with you about um, where are we? This is some call it this blue marble. We call it planet Earth and it is more aptly named planet ocean. So we're, we're on this, this, this blue planet and it is the water, which is the dominant element of this planet and the element that connects us all. We're going to go into our groups now and, and our small groups to be connected with each other and to share story and to share our passion. And so I invite you to think about future pace 20 years from now in the year 2042. 
And what do you envision this planet, this blue precious planet we have? What do you envision it looking like, feeling like? How will our waters be? How will we be together as this species? And while we call ourselves Homo sapiens, we're more aptly named Hydro sapiens. We are water beings. And the word sapiens is wise. How do we become wise water beings? So I give you, I had a chance to join some of you in your breakout rooms, didn't get a chance to get to all of you, yet here we are back. And um, there were some themes that I heard that were provocative and um, something I, I know that we could come to talk about. One, one of the themes that I heard about, and I'd love to hear from others, was about agriculture being such an important part of the equation here and how we've got to really reform agriculture practices globally because of the amount of water that's used for it. But then we went to the talk about um, the oceans and looking at oceans and really the issue of carbon because climate change is a water issue. Climate change is floods, it's droughts, it's fires, it's hurricanes, it's tsunamis, and of course it's melting glaciers. And everyone's looking at climate change as carbon, but they're really missing the connection with water being the driving force of all that. And there was discussion about the oceans being such a big carbon sink, actually bigger than the land is, and ideas for innovation in the oceans, for the oceans to be able to be, as uh, Todd Rowling said, about banking the carbon that's in the oceans and using the oceans as a way to grow food in the future, not just kelp, but, but other sources of food, because as we all know, our oceans have been depleted of so much of our sea life and of our fish species. So that's a really interesting idea but, and technology. But, 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 but Stuart, you're, you're overlooking, you know, you mentioned kelp and plants that you can kind of hold in your hands, but by the, by far the greatest carbon sink are the phytoplankton in the ocean. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, cubic hundreds of miles of phytoplankton. And that, that, that's why the phytoplankton blooms that you know I know so well uh, are, are pricelessly monitored and protected by the oceanographic institutes of the world. And, and among themselves, they say, as the plankton blooms go, so does humanity. Robert, can, I mean, I don't think a lot of people really know what plankton blooms are. Could you tell people that? Because I think that would be quite interesting. Well, where, where the conditions are correct, which typically involve a, a strong currents, strong tides, and some, something called upwelling, that are somewhat vortexes that bring minerals from the sea floor into a particular zone, phytoplankton and zooplankton, the plant and the animal versions of plankton, uh, take up residence in something we call a plankton bloom. And within this bloom, which can be anything from 75 to 500 kilometers across, uh, these two, uh, phyto uh, and zooplankton, coexist. The phytoplankton near uh, the surface to get the light, the zooplankton perhaps 300 feet below, and the zooplankton rise up uh, in, in, in the sea uh, to, to uh, dine on the phytoplankton, much like cows going to pasture and then returning. Hmm. And so in, in this bloom, which is magical in, in its chemical, biochemical complexity and diversity, uh, it is called the zone of biocenosis. It's, it's the greatest bioreactor on the planet. And there is, I believe there's nine like me, super mega plankton blooms and, and hundreds of smaller plankton blooms on the planet. So we happen to, I'm connected with that because we happen to, I'm associated with a company that derives a health and medical product from that water in the zone of biocenosis.
So what, what Robert's talking about is uh, sea plasma, sea mineral water, and a company called Quintan that Robert introduced me to. And, and part of my regimen with water is I yeah. purify my water. I structure my water with this device. It's a Mayu device, a company out of Israel. And then I add the sea plankton, the sea minerals back into my water because when we purify our water, we take out hopefully all the bad. But if there's any good there, we take that as well. I want to shift to about the oceans and what Todd was saying about the oceans. And Todd, with your background at Microsoft, could you just talk about, most people have no awareness um, of the amount of water that our data centers are using to power the internet and all of our connections and sure. where Microsoft is a huge acquirer of, of water rights and water assets and then innovative technology that you're working on relating to that. Could you share that with everyone? Sure, I'm happy to. So first of all, it's important to understand that in in a data center, which, which uh, the mega data centers in places like Des Moines, Iowa, um, all around the globe are are drawing, you know, we've got to, Microsoft had designs on the board for 160 megawatt data centers, which is larger than most cities. And all of that power, once it's gone through the computers, chips, and done its computing and storage and so on, it just gets turned into heat. So a data center is one big toaster, you know, so bring your bread. And, but, but then they have to cool the data centers, and then right now, most of the way that they do that is through forced air. The cool air, which is cooled by water, is, is blown through the servers. They have a cold aisle and a hot aisle. The hot aisle, then the air is taken back out and either sent back out in the atmosphere or, or recycled and recooled. So it's just important that everyone understand how a data center works. And then in order to cool that air, uh, they have to run water, typically groundwater, uh, uh, and, and chill it. And so this is where the water uh, is, is being used. And we run that water through lots of pipes. Mm -hmm. And we have to put chemicals into the water to keep it from corroding the pipes. And then these millions, literally millions of gallons of water that a data center uses uh, are then sent to a treatment plant to, it, it's just in, totally insane. Uh, so th they do have some initiatives going on where they are trying to be, produce a water-free data center. Some of the things that, that, that they're looking at are immersion cooling, which uh, again, Robert, this was a 3M uh, type innovation and, and, and there's, there's other companies involved as well, but uh, they, they produce what's called a dielectric because, you know, if you stick a computer or your phone in water, it's going to short out. But if you put these components into a dielectric, which means that it won't short it, it won't short it out, uh, they can literally run in this liquid. And the fluid flows around all the components and draws the heat away much, much more efficient than air. And so those are the things that we're looking at. Immersion cooling baths, uh, components that are encased, and then the fluid is inside. Uh, that there's some companies that that are are really coming out with some great inventions there. So Thank that you. that's on that that's on and, that. And front. the heat from that fluid is then heat transferred through the typical methods, cooling towers. So that's heat transferred to the air ultimately, right? Very yes, very, very okay. good point, Robert. Currently. The only two ways that they're that they're transferring that heat out of the fluid is is into um, into the air or back into a water system. In fact, the the Microsoft data centers that are that are testing this immersion cooling technology, uh, the the only two that we're doing it in Chicago and and San Antonio, their water they already have a water system. So. <laughs> Ultimately, they're not, they're not getting to the right end solution. So what, one of the things that I, I, I've talked to Stuart about is there's all sorts of new ways of drawing the heat and moving it out of you know, the, the, the fluid that, that's being used to cool the servers to the outside. One of the ways that's really cool is using carbon dioxide. It turns out that 
when you compress carbon dioxide, it's a little bit of a strange type of, of element where you know it goes from gas to solid. Any of you who have used dry ice understand that. And then it goes back to a liquid. And then when it's in, a, in a, a, another state, be, sort of between liquid and solid, it, it, it's called supercritical CO2. It has enormous, like 1,700 times the heat pulling capability and transferring wow. capability than water. Wow. 1,700 times. And so th this is an area that, that, that I just started doing some work in uh, b before I left. And there's some universities involved. So I won't go into great detail, but, but it's there and, and it's possible. Thanks. Thanks for bringing it up. One of our companies that we've invested in is called 374 Water, and it stands for 374 degrees because at that um, level of heat, water separates its liquid and solids, and it's called supercritical water oxidation. So that's a technology that they are bringing to market and innovation that we are supporting and investing and in funding and that's going to lead to some of these solutions that you talk about todd i see david aguado is here david welcome you're you're joining Hi. us from formentera and um i want to um, make sure that you put into the chat you, a link to your company agua de mar which is another source of sea plasma minerals that come from uh plankton blooms so please put that in the chat so people can see that or maybe Didier, you can do that so people can see that and they can learn more about that and, and see how to, to offer that. Um, Pete, Peter Williams, I'd love for you to share some thoughts you have relating to technology and innovations and maybe even something AI related for water solutions that are groundbreaking for us for the future. Yeah, um, so kind of by way of background, I. Um, was part of IBM's uh, water management business and all the sort of smarter planet and smarter cities stuff that they were um, doing. You probably remember the advertising. The principal issue with technology and the water industry is their gross inability to use even the technology that's, that's out there. There are plenty of water utilities around the world that don't even have water meters. There are even more water utilities around the world that are going, wait, this AMI, I suppose it's probably worth looking at. And they haven't looked at it yet. Uh, we were talking about this on our um, uh, breakout just now in the US where you've got 31,000 or whatever it is, utilities have fewer than 500 customers. They're run by one man and a dog. And when the man's in the pub, the dog's running the show. And um, they're never going to innovate. They can't. They've got no capacity to innovate. They've got no funds. They've got no time. They've got no skills. They've got no inclination. They're just going to do everything that um, they always did for good or bad. So that's, that's the base constraint. That being said, when you start to look at developments like digital twinning, which sort of came out of the offshore oil and gas industry and the um, uh, aerospace industry, uh, and when you start to look at the uh, application of AI, and I'll come to that in a minute, the... Um, uh, the potential is huge. It's just that it's going to take 25 years before it makes a difference at current course of speed. AI is really interesting, and there's so many different flavors of it. But the most impressive AI applications I've seen are where you have physics-based uh, models with AI used to tweak and tune those, um, whether that's about the operation of a water treatment plant, or um, uh, predicting the um, composition of the chlor the strength of the chlorine fraction in a water system given um, weather trends and that kind of thing. Um, so there's th those kinds of applications are out there. I'm, at this point in time, I'm a lot less persuaded by the um, sort of unsupervised learning. In theory, you could build a hydraulic model just by letting an AI loose on a water system and looking at the settings in the system and the pressure recording. Um, and eventually it would come up with a hydraulic model um, rather than buying a deterministic hydraulic model. Um, nobody's done that yet, uh, at least to my knowledge. Um, but in, I mean, in theory, you could do that. And um, Todd, it'd be interesting to talk to Microsoft about their uh, um, uh, activities in that area. Um, so again, it's a coming thing, um, but you know, it's, it's a bit like nuclear fusion, you know, where people used to joke that it's a technology of the future and always will be. 
um, the um, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, um, digital twinning, um, yada, 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 all of those things in the water industry, they will happen. They are happening in some cases. Um, but getting beyond the early adoption phase is really quite um, it, it, it's it's really quite a battle. There's a great organization, by the way, if anybody wants to know more, that is um, advocating this stuff. And you, some of you probably already know it called SWAN, S-W-A-N. Um, and um, I, I think it stands for Strategic Water Action Network or something like that. Um, but the acronym is SWAN. Um, just Google SWAN Water and you'll, you'll find their website. You'll probably get a lot of pictures of birds as well. But um, just... Um, uh, Google them and you'll find them. Um, they've got some great stuff, some great thought pieces on, for example, digital twins and exactly what the hell is a digital twin in the water industry anyway, because um, there's a gazillion different definitions of them. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, those are, those are some instant thoughts. I'm working in point of fact for an entrepreneur who I won't name, who wanted to make a ground um, breaking play in the water industry. And he's now just come to the conclusion that actually the water industry just will not move fast enough for his purposes. Um, and there's a whole yeah. bunch of historical reasons for that. Um, the lack of profit motive might be part of it, but there's a whole bunch of other reasons as well, um, rooted in the historic price of water and so on and so on. So, yeah, the technology is there, actually, uh, for the most part. Um, you know, there are a few kinds of sensors that um, don't yet exist that might usefully be invented. But for the most part, the information technology is there and ready and available to use. It just needs to be used and applied and brought down in price. But that's not going to happen. Uh, at least it's not going to happen rapidly. You're going to get point source applications uh, for the next the next little while, certainly. Great uh, insights, Peter. and. Um... As we've said, the water industry is stuck in its old ways <clears throat> and that what is going to shift the water industry is going to be new people, young people, women coming into the industry and leading these, these changes that need to occur. It's not going to happen from within the existing industry. And it's going to come from people like yourself that have come from other um, disciplines that is engineering and AI and data analytics and human health and, and other areas that are gonna bring their disciplines into the water industry, similar to what's happened to the food industry and the ag industry is that people came from outside of that and brought their ideas and technologies and innovations into that, which completely transformed food with the whole world of plant-based protein and acellular agriculture and um, all the innovations that are happening in the food industry and the water industry is prime and ready for it. It's just, you know, it's just time for it to come. Could I make one more comment? Please. Uh, which is uh, a, re a really important thing to keep in mind as well. You're, uh, you don't need to go be in the water industry very long. You only need to attend about one conference and probably the first 10 minutes of the conference before you hear somebody say, well, we need to break down the functional silos. Uh, well, forget it. The functional silos are there for a reason. Uh, oftentimes they're legally mandated, but they're there for preserving skills. They're there for clarity of responsibility and so on and so on. So the functional silos are a fact of freaking life. Get used to it. The question is, how do you enable information to flow across the silo boundaries? And how do you create zero, um, sorry, win-win arrangements between the different silos where they all contribute information to a central picture and they get back more than they contribute? That's got to be the paradigm. So you've got to create my original PhD is in politics, which is why I have an interesting perspective on information systems. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to create a reason for everybody to contribute the information in the first place mm -hmm. so that they're all they all think they're winning and nobody is poking about in everybody else's data and all that kind of thing. So technologies that help functional silos work together, not technologies that break down functional silos. Thank you for bringing that up because that's that's really what we are envisioning creating through the HydroDAO community is bringing these people together right. and seeing right. the systems of water and, and the approach that we all are in together and wastewater is tied to the oceans, it's tied to our food and ag, it's tied to you know all the innovations that are here. Right. Um, I, I wonder, Bob Bocock, if could you just share with us some insights that you have and 
particularly about, we haven't talked about this, but a lot of people don't know about the PFAS issue. And Seth, you know, his book, The, the Trouble with Our Water, um, is, a, is a topic that most people just have no idea and just trust the fact that our water delivered to us through utilities is fine. And I don't want to alarm people, but I also think it's important for people to understand what's in the water and the issues, and particularly PFAS, because it's it's the issue that's the, the asbestos of our, our globe coming forward. Sure, uh, yeah, I can talk about it briefly. It's, it's, uh, it's virtually everywhere. Everyone on this call has uh, the perfluorinated uh, compounds in their blood um, today. It's in your organs. Unlike other contaminants in the past, um, these chemicals um, actually get into our bodies and have a nine and a half year half-life in our, in our tissue. Um, they follow the protein chains. They do not follow the carbohydrate chains. And so um, they initially were introduced as a drinking water contaminant under the unregulated contaminant monitoring rule for uh, uh, US EPA uh, in the Safe Drinking Water Act to basically look and see what their occurrence was. And so they set a health advisory at 400 um, nanograms per liter. And, and ultimately, um, they've gone down to 70 about 18 months ago. And within the last, uh, I guess, three months, they've dropped it to 0 0.004. And the reason for that, um, you know, quite frankly, is they said, gosh, you know, uh, it's, a, it's a carcinogen, so we should probably set it at zero. That's the requirement at EPA that any carcinogen gets set at zero. But they said, ah, everything causes cancer. The second thing that they said was uh, it, it disrupts the endocrine system. It's, it's lowering sperm counts. It's lowering um, all kinds of, of, of uh, endocrine system uh, damages and things like that. But every, every, uh, all the contaminants cause that. So that's not really the issue. So they went to the third thing in the health, uh, the health studies, and they basically looked at it and they said, well, um, you know, when a woman gets pregnant, she's literally passing that, that chemical that's been stored in her body. Uh, onto her infant. And then if she breastfeeds after birth, she's literally lowering her PFAS concentrations through breast milk and, and concentrating them in the new unborn child or not in, in, the, in the newly born child. So um, they're, they're seeing a concentration there. What caused them to drop it from 400 to 70 to 0 0.004 so fast is that what they've identified is, is we've scotch guarded our bloodstream. And so by scotch guarding our bloodstream, what we've done is, uh, you know, within the first three months of life, the babies go back to the doctor, they get all their immunizations, the MMR, they get uh, polio. And what they're finding is, is with scotch guarded blood, the immune response is um, actually uh, hindered. So they're not having the same immune response to immunizations that they once did. And that's what caused the immediate lowering of these chemical contaminants. Um, in the drinking water system. Um, every, the good news in drinking water, we think we've solved the problem. It does readily absorb to granular activated carbon. Um, not all carbons are, are created equal. Um, there's been a tremendous amount of testing uh, on the Cape Fear River, which is where DuPont manufactured these chemicals and they actually were, were heavily contaminating the Cape Fear River and the drinking water systems in North Carolina. So th those studies, they've, they've identified drinking water treatment technologies. Um, Somebody said there were 16,000 wastewater treatment plants. They are all emitting uh, uh, PFAS out of the wastewater treatment plants. If, if, you, uh, if you think you're, you're uh, one of those that is environmentally clean, take your Patagonia jacket, throw it in the laundry and wash it. You're washing PFAS into your laundry and it's going to the wastewater treatment plant that recharges our aquifers that, that uh, you know, is the sources of drinking water for most of our surface water treatment plants. And it's a vicious cycle. So that's the... That's kind of the contaminant de jour. Um, we are going to solve the drinking water problem, but we are we are emitting this uh, uh, through our wastewater systems at, at by the pounds per day. Um, the the uh, Tennessee River they actually have NPDES permits for PFAS, mm -hmm. and I, I I think it's Decatur, Alabama can discharge 75 pounds a day into the Tennessee River, and the drinking water system uptake is 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 a mile down the river. So um, until we can get our arms around this, we're going to continue to to recontaminate ourselves. Um, the, the largest blood level concentration of PFAS is the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. So if that tells you anything, uh, you know that, that uh, that's where it's going. Um, it's found in polar bear blood. So like I said, everybody on this call's got some um, and we're just not sure where it's going. <clears throat>
I'd so, like to comment something on this. Sure. Uh, on this uh, regarding the reduction of PFAS in drinking water. I, I do because of uh, what uh, uh, Bob just said. Uh, yes, there are many forms of carbon, many different adsorptive capacities, et cetera. And the fact that carbon retains its adsorbed contaminants and continually loses its capacity, et cetera, it's a very complex uh, phenomenon. And that's why I prefer that if we're concerned about PFAS for drinking water, it's not realistic for the whole home is to have reverse osmosis, or even distillation preceding the activated carbon, which keeps the carbon clean of most other uh, contaminants that would reduce its capacity. Thanks, Robert. Yeah, and, and there's some products that we'd be happy to share with you that Robert is um, knowledgeable of and, and a big fan of that will remediate PFAS in drinking water in your home. And um, it's just something that we need to understand. We just need to become educated. And it's not about creating fear or um, turmoil. It's just understand what's in your water. And, and you know, as Bob is um, uh, the water advisor for Aaron Brockovich, and helps Erin with, with most of her technology and her understanding of the water industry and a lot of the advocates and the lobbying to the water industry. And I mean, she, you know, she is on a, a rampage um, with helping low-income and minority communities who are more deeply impacted than anybody because of the, the poor quality of water that they have and the lack of voice and lobbying that they have. And so Bob is deeply involved and act, active with Aaron in helping people understand this and begin to demand by our, uh, whether it's our state or federal governments to say, you know, this isn't okay. And it's not just PFAS, it's glyphosate Roundup that's in all our water. And it's another class of how many, 250 other toxins, Bob, that are in our water? Uh you're being kind. I, I'd say it's about 15,000. Um, but with the right amount of information, you know, we can do great things. Mm -hmm. And it's the problem is, um, you know, I, I, working around the country, I, I don't want to pick on any particular area, but, you know, in Texas, PFAS is don't ask, don't tell. Um, and and uh, so it, with the right information out there, people have the ability to remediate for themselves, as Robert was saying, you know, home water treatment systems and, and different things like that are becoming more and more important. I think there's a whole new area of um, activity that really, really needs to ramp up more than it has too around pharmaceutical decomposition. Um, yes. Products. Yes. PFAS are, PFAS are bad enough. Yeah. But when One you, of the primers. When you discover, sorry, I was going to say that thing like um, a contrasting agent like iopamidol can break down into um, um, what, what are they called? Iodated cyanogens. Yes. Very carcinogenic. Yeah. yeah. yeah I so mean, the Peter's primer today was what can we do today that's going to impact where we're going to be in 20 years? Um, I will tell you that, you know, people are saying, well, how do we get these water utilities? Seth was saying, how do we get these water utilities to, to consolidate? How do we get, you know, management? How do we get an appreciation for the cost of water and the value of water? And I think what I think the paradigm shift that we're going to experience in the next two to three years is the consumer is fast becoming the regulator. The regulatory community has completely failed at their job. And I think that the consumer is going to start to be um, the one that's demanding the compliance. Right. Could I, sorry, not to monopolize the conversation. Could I just ask one simple question? I just Googled, do PFAS break down in ultraviolet light? And in the first two uh, things, I've got yes and no. Um, so do PFAS break down in ultraviolet light? No. No, okay. No, right. Agreed. no, no, no. Agreed. Right, because this one that says photochemical degradation by UV light is to date one of the most effective ways to break down PFAS is a crock of shit then. Yeah, yeah, no, right. it, it doesn't. Cool. If, it, if it worked, we would be, we'd be doing it. All <laughs> oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, yeah, okay, uh, thank you. But, 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 but perhaps UV, UV combined with another oxidative technology like ozone, which is called photooxidation, it could be, uh, I, I, I don't know for certain, could 
could be a combination that does destroy PFAS. Yeah, we're, we're investigating advanced oxidation processes. So we're, we've tried <laughs> peroxide, we've tried chlorine, we've tried chlorine dioxide, and you put those in and then you, and then you hit it with the UV light. Um, and they do break down 1,4-dioxane. That's the only way you can treat that little guy. Beautiful. Um, so they, they do break down certain components. It's just um, that bond between the carbon and the fluorine is is infinite. <laughs> Got yeah, it. It, there are there are ten thousand perfluorinated compounds in in commerce and patents today. Ten thousand. Ouch. Ouch. Well, you've done. You have some good research that's very valuable to me. Great. And the important point here is that once again, we just need to know. And as Bob says it's really up to us as a consumer to have a voice to say, you know, this is not okay. And um, to demand of whether it's, once again, the water agencies themselves or it's the politicians to say, you know, we're not willing to tolerate this and we're not gonna allow ourselves to be poisoned by the water. And, and that's what's gonna create the change. It's not gonna come from a, a state or federal uh, leader or issue or mandate it's going to be consumer says no more and you know you've got the flint michigans that um had their their issue that occurred and you know it was the consumers that really said you know this is not okay and of course it was once again minority low-income communities who don't have mm -hmm. as loud of a voice as mm -hmm. the money does so it's up to us as individuals to take responsibility and say we won't tolerate this well, one, Stuart, one, one of the uh, monkey wrenches in all of this is, is, is this. One, uh, oh, less than 2% of the water that comes to your home is consumed, okay, in any form, whether for drinking water or food production, food, food processing. And, and, and then it, it, Congress is holding back, you know, a, a couple hundred unregulated contaminants and part of the reason is what Bob said, this is an economic challenge. If you're willing to put in, uh, if you're willing to pay whatever, five times more for your water delivered to your home when only you're using 2% of it for human consumption, not that, not that bathing in it is, is not without its problems, then you know, it's, it's realizable, but it is a cost is going to represent a very big cost increase to, in, to add technologies that can remove PFAS chemical from uh, water supplies. Well, there's a, there's a question of what is the cost and the near-term cost of, right of remedying that, but what is the cost of our healthcare and, and our health and our food and everything else that the, the water is filled with and is, part of our daily lives, it needs to go, I believe, beyond this notion of cost to value. What is the value of, of the water? And it's a value from sustaining our lives and our health and well-being. And there's just a huge shift that has to happen from an understanding and education. And we need to get out of the mindset, as Peter has said, of this old mindset of the industry. It's, it's just got to change because it's unsustainable and it's broken. Yes. Well, I think, I, I mean, I think, you know, a, a, a potential solution is, is uh, and it has been for a long time, you know, obviously bottled water is one solution. Most bottled water is very, is quite pure and regulated, et cetera, et cetera. And, and then point of use water treatment, which is some kind of filtration, reverse osmosis, distillation, carbon, et cetera, is very effective. And you don't, uh, you don't have to treat all that water in your house. You're just treating, uh, uh, you know, the drinking water and and the other, uh, you know, food preparation uses. Thanks, Robert. Karen, if you're there, I'd be interested to hear from you about what Evoca is doing in this area. Yeah, I'm here, Stuart. Um, I would just say at this point, we're evaluating a lot of different PFAS treatment technologies. Um, and we're offering standard treatment today with RO and um, granular activated carbon, but we're clearly looking towards the future and what an array of different technologies that are under development. 
Well, it's important, I think, for Evoca and the other water companies to have a leadership position here and to take responsibility for helping the, the, the consumer, you know, even if they're not wow. educated to, to do what, what the, um, the water technology companies like Evoca can do to bring these technologies forward. Anyone else have anything else you wanted to share or talk about before we head off? Well, there's been an, an enormous um, a number of uh, conversations that have occurred in the chats. And I know that there was a lot of lively discussion in our breakout rooms together. And I'm so pleased that we've had this time for us all to connect with each other, as you can see, there's so many people that one are brilliant and understand water at such a deep level and are so valuable for us to learn. And secondly, for them to have their voice come forward as leaders for us to one, become educated and two, for us as individuals to take action in our lives. And as we keep saying, we're gonna do this together. So we at Hydrodel are committed. We have made a commitment that in 20 years, Together, we are going to solve our global water challenges. And we're gonna do that with us uniting with each other and understanding and realizing that there is a cost, uh, but the cost is not just a dollar cost. There's so many costs that relate to the health of our bodies and the health of all of our resources on our planet. I'm deeply grateful for all of you to be here. We're going to have um, another uh, Oceanside chat in December, which we'll be letting you know about. And we'd love to hear from you all as, as uh, you know, you want to engage. And for those of you that don't know, we have a channel called Discord, which is a platform, which Didier, if you want to put that in the chat, please, or Peter, that you can see that's a platform that is the community um, portal, I'll call it. That's like a Slack uh, tool that you can use to connect with people, that you can bring up topics, you can ask questions, you can get things answered. We're talking about all the innovations that are coming forward. And that's the platform we're using for the HydroDAO community to unite and come together to look at these solutions and to realize that it's all one water. There's no separation. The water here in Kauai is connected to the water in Bangladesh and in Russia and Ukraine and in Flint. So. Let us all unite in our water and uh, have gratitude for what water does for us every day to sustain our lives and, and bring us that goodness of life. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you Sending everyone. everyone aloha.